Okay, we're back, up and running. Uh, everybody can read that pretty clearly? Okay, uh, I'm trying to figure out where we uh, ended up last week. Um, which one? Anxiety. We ended up in anxiety. Mm. Okay, well, let's, yeah, we can return to that. It won't go away. Uh, okay, so here we have. Um, I'm just trying to figure out if tonight's text is the same one, if we're ready to go with it. Um, so we have the two types of awakening, the teachings, right? We went through that. The direct realization. Uh, we got to the passage as you would recognize your father uh, at the crossroads. Did we do that? Okay. Just when you know for yourself. And we went through uh, the kusala kushala, right? Okay, so so we're right uh, to the so Han Chan is going uh, further now into different ways of looking at. Uh, the self-cultivation and the awakening. Uh, this passage tonight says, if I'm reading this direct realization, is that where we are? Okay, so this direct realization can further be differentiated and deep and shallow by applying effort. And while you, while you see all these slash marks, you know, uh, parentheticals and so forth, is because we're still working on this. This is a work in progress. Uh, we just finished this last night. And usually we end up never really fully decided what the final version is. So we leave it kind of raw. And then towards the end of the semester, we uh, spend two or three days together polishing it. So um, by applying effort at, and we have the root, the fundamentals, uh, something deep here, uh, you will break through the layer. Everybody know what layer, L-A-I-R? It's not a misspelling for liar. It's layer. What's a layer? Uh, it could be a cave. A what? Lions, a lions live in layers, right? Huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, dragons live in layers. Mice live in layers, I suppose. But what is it? Yeah, it's it's a it's covered. It's a it's both a shelter and a hideaway. Um, to use both. Um, it's an interesting language here. Uh, for here, we also, you look at the Chinese above, we, can, we started with hideout and nest, which is another translation. So, the, so the, we have, uh, you will break through the hideout, the nest, the lair, the eighth conscious. This sounds very dramatic, doesn't it? Um, and directly expose the cave of ignorance. So this is very rich uh, language, what's going on here. He's saying when you really cultivate uh, and you really go directly into uh, your own mind and your own consciousness, and if you stay steady with this practice and you have a good method um, and a good teaching, uh, you will quickly uh, go through layers of consciousness until you come to the root. Uh, now this is represented here by the eighth consciousness, the alaya consciousness, the deep storehouse, the repository. And he says, when you break through, there's a layer um, to the eighth consciousness and directly expose the cave of ignorance. So he's saying, in a sense, the eighth consciousness is innate wisdom or prajna, but it's not fully liberated. It's not fully functioning. So at the stage of it being the eighth consciousness, the deepest layer of consciousness, it still has elements that are confused, that are clouded over, that are hidden, hide away, since you get this language or the cave-like 
Um, and therefore, you have to, in a sense, we use the language breakthrough, but really what's going on here is you, you penetrate through the illusory shadows of the eighth consciousness until you actually awaken fully. So the eighth consciousness is both a lair and a hideout and a cave, but it's also uh, the bodhimanda. It's also the place of awakening. So in the confused state, when it's not clear, when it's still grasping, attaching, and confused, it is like a hideout, um, and it's like a cave. The cave here works really well. I won't go back into this. Night. You all remember when we did uh, Plato's cave, the analogy? And we had, I think we had both a cartoon version and another version up there, but representing. This is pretty close um, to the analogy that Plato uses for um, human confusion or attachment or superstition or lack of knowledge. It's like we're living in a cave and we're prisoners in the cave. This is how Plato's analogy goes. And there's a light or a, a fire behind us <laughs> like this. Uh, let's see, who's got the... Oh, you can't do that. Can you put your hand in front of there? No, huh? You can't reach over. It's too far. Okay, if I were to put my hand between the light and the screen, you would see the shadow my hand projected onto the screen. And if the room were a little smoky with incense and whatnot, I was doing this, you couldn't really tell what that was, but you'd have a sense, maybe as a hand or something. So Plato was saying, in the unenlightened or unawakened uh, stage, we see images and shadows of reality. We don't see the real thing. Uh, and we're in this cave. Uh, but we take it to be the real thing because we've been in this cave for such a long time. And so it looks like it's real. And everybody around us is facing the same direction with the same illusory screen. And everybody agrees that's what's really going on. Um, but what happens then? You graduate to the next cave where there's more shadows, and that's called uh, secondary school. And you go to another cave, and that's called college. And you go to another cave. You just keep going through the caves, right? And the images get more elaborate. And you think you're really learning, but all you're doing is accumulating shadows um, of things that might, you know, might be or imagined. But what happens then in, in Plato's analogy? One guy gets out. And what happens when he gets out? Right, he, he goes into the whole sunny world, and he's, as you say, freaked out. Although Plato doesn't use that language, it's, it's it, the image. He's blinded by the light, and he can't see. And he's convinced now that he has entered the world of ignorance because he's lost vision. He can't see anymore. But it's only a temporary state because he's not been in the light for so long. His eyes are unaccustomed to what is true and real and bright. After a while, as his eyes sort of adjust and come back, he sees, oh my gosh, there's this vast world out here of plants and animals and other people and the sky and the stars and so on and so forth. And he has the equivalent of awakening experience and sees, my gosh, now he sees when I was in the cave of ignorance, I was only beholding images and shadows, not real things. But now that I'm out and I see, I once was blind and now I see it's, you know, the song, uh, he has this profound, liberating, joyous um, experience. And then what does he do? He goes back into the cave because he's got some kindness. And he says, I should go back in and tell everybody that what they're looking at here is really just a video. I mean, they're locked in the movie theater here, and they think they've been, it's movie after movie after movie. You know, if you can imagine, Plato's Cave would just be a movie theater or your little TV den with your sound system, and you're in there 24-7. And after a while, you think this is real. And you turn on the next flick, and it's Arnold Schwarzenegger making to come back, and blah, 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 and you think, that's real. And you go on and on, like, and if somebody pulls the shades, opens to the light, you're, you'll go like that. It'll be, and when you go out into the real world, it seemed to you at first unreal. Now, and the people in the cave, when he comes back in, they say, thank you, really appreciate this. We were wondering about, no, right? <laughs> no, they, they, they think, he, they reject him. They think he's nuts. And so he can't convince them that this is the case. So here, although we're, I'm not saying Plato's exactly saying, but it's very, very close to what's implied here. In the state of confusion, in the state of attachment, 
and grasping, we have, we have shrunk our consciousness, which is vast and great and able to comprehend everything according to the text. It is uninhibited in its scope of knowing. We have shrunk it. We've collapsed it down to a cave-like myopic view, me and mine and this little world, the past, the present, and the future, and my day-to-day, -day and, you know, and so forth. And what he's saying is, when you do the cultivation, that cave will just break apart, and you'll be in the light again. So he uses that. Now, the lair uh, is an interesting one, the hideout uh, or the nest. In a sense, what he's saying there is the eighth consciousness has both the seeds, bija, of all that's wholesome and good that we have done, and, and the traces of that, if you will, as well as the traces or the um, uh, residuals, another word that's used, of all that we've done that's unwholesome. It's all there. So everything we thought, said, or done, the three karmas of body, mouth, and mind, have a trace that continue and continue in the eighth consciousness. And this eighth consciousness goes from life to life. It's sort of like the seed that gives birth then to the next incarnation, if you want to go with that language, or the next day. Let's not go to future lives. From day to day, it is, this, it is the string of continuity of who we are, what we think we are, and our view of reality and so forth is, is continuous through this consciousness. So when he says layer, he's talking about as we go into this through the self-cultivation practice and particularly with meditation, then all of these things start to show up. They start to come into more active consciousness from being deeply buried. Now this can happen during a meditation retreat. It can happen while you're bowing. It, if you cultivate in a regular way, it can happen in the most unexpected time while you're driving along the freeway. It doesn't have to happen in a state of absorption with your legs crossed. And as these things come up and manifest, he's, he's telling us to be uh, steady and unmoved and just let these things arise, observe them, and let them play out. And as you do your cultivation, that's what will happen. However, he's saying this is somewhat of a layer. In other words, it's a very convoluted, hidden away um, hideout wherein all these things are not easily accessible. And they can come as a surprise. So... When you break through, he says, every, everything is immediately reckon, uh, realized. Nothing remains to be done. You've gone back to the root. You've gone back to the source. The texts say that you've done what needs to be done. This is, a, this is it. You've, you've cultivated to a spiritual realization. You don't need to do any more of this. Now, this doesn't mean that your life is over. It's actually just beginning. But you've done the hard work of returning back to the root and source of your true being. This awakening demonstrates, he says, this particular, this direct penetrating awakening is the one that demonstrates the highest faculties and the deepest realization. The shallow, on the other hand, what he calls the shallow, goes along in stages, so it's a more gradual stage thing, whereas this one is very direct, um, but not necessarily fast. <laughs> I want to qualify this. By direct, it means you're going directly to the depths of consciousness. You're not going through gradual stages of cultivating blessings and merit, of um, doing various practices and building up and so on and so forth, um, resolving you know, to be an arhat, and then as you move along, resolving to be a pratyeka Buddha and so on and so forth. You're going directly to the Buddha mind, your own original nature in this. So although it's more direct, it could take more time, as you can see. And the example I gave uh, before was climbing a mountain. If you go up by the switchbacks, on a, how many of you have climbed mountains? Okay, a lot of people here climb mountains. Wow, it's good to see you all here. <laughs> a lot of people don't come back from climbing mountains. They go the direct route and then... <laughs> so, uh, now I won't ask you what size. You could say, well, El Cerrito Hill. I know, <laughs> but... Uh, if you do the switchbacks, you know, it'll take you a lot longer. 
and you acclimate slower, the oxygen gets thinner, but you're taking your time, you camp one, camp two, camp three, have your marshmallows and chocolate, sing some songs, you know, take your time off. If you say, I gotta get to the top of the mountain before sunset, you go up the direct route, you go a straight line, as the crow flies, so we speak. But that is, by and far, the most difficult, because it's the steepest, and it's not trailed. You have to actually cross country it up to the top. Uh, so, you may not get there actually as fast because you run out of energy, uh, you meet obstacles, it's harder to get around, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a parallel. And he's saying instead of the stages, it's this one is a direct line. Now, to illustrate this, um, and I like to do this because sometimes the language seems abstract, Buddhism uh, is very rich with metaphors, imagery, and I would say even poetry that help us visualize this, um, these processes of the mind that actually are almost mirrors to the process of the mind, but they're in very um, literal, uh, figurative uh, representations like images, art, uh, poetic language. So tonight, what I was going to do was to show you a couple of slides. Finally, we got to the slides I said we were going to do. And these are Buddhist representations of this kind of journey so that people can understand it by looking at it rather than through the abstractions of words. Uh, so what I'm going to show you tonight are s some images from a place called Borobudur. Um, anybody know about Borobudur? Where is it? Indonesia. Indonesia. And it's in the jungle of Indonesia. And there's Borobudur. Okay, now, are there, I can't turn around and look, are there any people on the ground there? You can get a scale? Yeah, so you see it's, it's, it's rather large. Yes? <laughs> right, rather large. And so Borobudur is a very ancient Buddhist um, site uh, in Indonesia. It's out in the jungle area. Um, it's very hot, at least it was when I was there. I got sunstroke. Um, this monk who was with me kept giving me his hat, his straw hat, and I said, nah, I don't wear straw hats, don't need it, you know. And I just strutting around while the sun is just beating down. So the time I got to Bura Badur, um, Bura Badur was moving. <laughs> it was like floating, uh, and I almost collapsed. Uh, but Bura Badur is meant to convey some key concepts in Buddhism. It, con uh, it conveys the idea of the three realms, the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. So a, a state of consciousness, let's say, where your mind is completely caught up in material things and material world, to the next level where you leave that behind, but you're now into still uh, forms and uh, representations of things, so your attachments are less. And then finally, what's called the formless realm, where you're even beyond that. Now, this also represents stages of uh, meditation samadhis. Okay, so this, this, there's a kind of parallel. It's, it's both real realms represented as, as, as realms of existence, but it's also states of consciousness, and in fact, the two are not two, but they're one. In other words, the realm of existence you in, are in is actually a manifestation and a reflection of your consciousness and bodies. So you, you get where I'm going with this. So, but this is hard for ordinary people to guess. So one of the things Bora Badur did, uh, whoever designed this, and I don't know where the origins of, they, they took Buddhist concepts, including some of the Jataka stories. You remember I've been telling you the Buddhist past life stories? And the imagery uh, from the various realms, and they've carved them onto this rock in three stages. Can you see the three stages? So the top stage is the third. Yes, and so, so what you do is you go, uh, go into the entrance here, and your first level that you go around is uh, a freezes of incredibly busy artwork. And it shows the six paths of existence, the hells, the animals, hungry ghost, and so forth. And you see, um, and warfare is, is portrayed. Um, thank you. No, I have to learn how to use this. There we go. <laughs> no, I know I'm not supposed to point. So. <laughs> Well, 
Yeah, but the red one doesn't. Oh, there. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Me with technology, be here all night. Um, just so you just look at it. When you go around the frieze, first of all, you're very close to it because the pathway between the wall and the wall you're looking at is quite narrow. So you go up there and you feel a kind of claustrophobia. You're up against these images of warfare, of fighting, of greed, of lust, of betrayal, of uh, animals, um, people becoming animals, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's, it's busy and it's, it's a little bit irritating. And then you go around and you do the full circle. You get to the next one and you go up the steps. Now, it's interesting because when I was there, I thought, boy, this architect, you know, was really didn't have it together because the steps aren't even. You know, going into the first realm, it's like, you're there. You know, I'm the tourist. You got your camera. You're going, going, going. You think, I go up the next one, and the steps are higher and further apart. And so you have to work a little to get up to this next level. And it's hot. And so you're working. You get to the next level. This is a form realm. Totally different. You have tranquil scenes of the heavens, of people in meditation, of, of, of calmness, of exchanges in communities, of uh, imagery, of... of the, the, the exalted or the transcendent realm, but it's still in the freeze and you're still, but you're not as quite as close this time. So you have a little room to breathe. And then you go to that fourth circle and you come to the last one and then the steps are really steep and far apart and it's really hard to get up and you go up and then there's no railings. See, there's no lawyers here that are going to sue you. <laughs> they don't care about that. So you go, no railings. If you fall, it's like too bad. You fell into the form rail. It could have been worse. <laughs> so you go up to the form rail, and that's that top platform. And so it's, it's quite remarkable, the experience. Now, can we go to that? Uh, okay, so this is a lower realm, right? This is on the form. You see a Buddha sitting, but you're still going along the wall. Look at another one. Uh, go back. Is there another one of the lower realm? No, no, no. That's it? Okay, so imagine you're doing the rotation. You're there. You feel enclosed, although there's some sky above. It's, it's a narrow thing. When you do the last step up, it takes your breath away because there's no railings. There's nothing. There's no wall anymore. You're on the plateau, and you have a 360-degree view. Okay? Look at this. I'm trying to get, yeah, go back one to the one that gives a really, is there another one? There. So you're, you're actually walking here, and the only thing are these little stupid pagoda type things. And then, curiously, the Buddha, the Buddha's in some of them, and then some of them are empty, representing sunyata, emptiness itself. So you're going, I'm going to go see the Buddha. There's no Buddha in there, it's just empty. And it's like, right, at this stage, not even the Buddha has, there's not even the mark of Buddha. But you see what's emerging here is emerging out of consciousness, out of the eighth consciousness, the beginning of. And so it's, it's an embryonic kind of visual thing of the Buddha and the 360 degrees. So this is breaking out of the cave, so to speak, of ignorance, but it's represented all visually. There's no words here, there's no scriptures. This is all a kind of visceral experience you have not only is it visceral with your eyes but your actual labor to get to the top and then that breathlessness almost vertigo that you feel when you're on the top because you walk to the edge and again there's no railings there's nothing but you and space in all directions um, on a clear night with a full moon I tell you this is an ethereal experience because you actually feel you've ascended into space itself and so it's quite amazing. So this is the, well, it's a five-star pagoda <laughs> because at the time we were monks. And there's certain privileges you get as monks that you don't get. So the same thing happened in Bogaya. We got to spend the night under the Bodhi tree. Everybody goes home and we get to spend the night in the Bodhi tree which is, for me, spending the night in any other tree. It wasn't. <laughs> and it was even made worse by the fact I had this image. I'm going to spend my night in the Bodhi tree, just like the Buddha. I'm going to sit here in full lotus, and as soon as the mosquitoes stop, I'm going to get awakened. <laughs> and so the mosquitoes stopped, and I thought, I don't know. The Tibetan monks came with their long horns <laughs> all night long. <laughs> So I didn't get awakened here or at the Bodhi tree. Uh, 
But I did have that experience that I, I imagine everybody has when they go through this process of walking to the top. You all of a sudden sense, I can breathe again, I can see again, I'm out of this cave. And it's, it's, a, it's a very palpable uh, feeling of liberation and vision. Uh, and so this is how it's represented. Now, the, the layer or the hideout, I have another image, and this came from a trip that we did uh, to China. And could you show that? We're going now to the layer of the consciousness that convoluted. Oh, well, let's come back to that one. Go to the, yeah, get them all up. There. Okay, so this, um, this is in Oakland, and uh, you've never seen it before? <laughs> no, this is in China. It's called Jiangjiajie. It's a, a remote uh, protected area. Uh, the geography, the geology of this is just absolutely stunning. I, I can't give you scale, but a person on any one of those you wouldn't even see. It's so vast, right? And this... It just comes out, and there's you go way, way down to these gorges and can walk, and it's a labyrinth. You can get lost in this so fast. Some have streams. There's all kinds of caves there. There's all twists and turns. If you don't have a guide and don't know what you're doing, you could end up never coming out of there again, really. But as we found out, and I use this as a, a sort of a model to say this is like the eighth consciousness with all the twists and turns and everything that's stored in there. And it's very hard to navigate. Now if you go to the next picture. Uh, so <laughs> here's your beginning cultivation. Uh, you've actually, you know, you've got a little bit of an overview of what it looks like. So you take this uh, gondola lift, you go over before you descend. Um, is CS here? Yes. Oh, yes. Is this bringing back nightmares for you? <laughs> he, <laughs> C.S. was on the trip with us, and we, we didn't realize that he had acrophobia or fear of heights. So when we got up in this, um, he was actually clinging, and then somebody in the group thought it'd be fun to rock it back and forth. <laughs> so you didn't have an awakening experience, right, C.S.? No. no. <laughs> but this... Imagery represents the idea that now you begin to get in a vehicle. If you want to think of the vehicles as the vehicles for cultivation. And the vehicle can transport you over the top, so to speak, so you can get a purview of the, the landscape of the Eighth Consciousness. This being done, you still have to go and work your way through. So the process of doing this uh, takes time and experience and a good map. Uh, and so this, this was the image I was going to represent. I don't think I have any more JPEGs, right? Okay. So these are two. One, oh, the thing about this is it used to be, in fact, a hideout for bandits. And so when uh, bandits, robbers, um, outlaws uh, wanted to hide away and not be found, they would disappear into here, and the authorities 90% of the times would never be able to catch them in there because it's, you, you would just get lost. So the idea of the hideout or the nest is a perfect kind of metaphor for, for this. Um, and in a sense, the landscape that you navigate as you open up and understand yourself. And then if you think of that landscape, and then you have the contrast, the top of Bourbadour, you see the, the range of what's, what's going on here. So this is, this is good in terms of imagery. Helpful? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you would, let's see what the next part of the text is, what I want to do. Okay. So now what I want to do is uh, some poetry. And if you would, pull up the, the poems. Uh, some of you know this, we've talked about this before. These are poems from Hanshan, but not the Hanshan. Okay, so they both have the same sounding name. Hanshan that we're doing here is the um, time of Shakespeare. Okay, and this Hanshan is where? 
way back in the Tong. And so his name translates as Cold Mountain. Sean is Mountain, Cold Mountain. He was a hermit monk um, who went to this place, and the place really exists. There is a Cold Mountain. I, has Hunkshire showed you his slides from Cold Mountain last week? Okay, so it's an actual place that exists, but what I'm trying to bring out tonight is through the language, figurative language and metaphors of the, the poem, you're going to see that he has symbolized the state of self-cultivation, working on the mind and getting awakened through the projection of language into the poems of nature. So each one of these images, the mountain, the water, the dew, the wind, the trees, the rocks, all represent things that Hanshan, this other hanshan has been talking about with states of consciousness. And so you navigate this landscape. So let's just look at, I, I just, I selected two, to, two of each tonight. So the first two I've selected are to convey the initial start of your cultivation, the difficulty, the obstacles, the, the sense that, my gosh, I'm on this landscape, this barren landscape of my own mind. How do I possibly not only navigate and find a place to dwell here, but get comfortable and relaxed. Um, how do I get through all of this? So let's do the first one. The path to Han Shan's place is laughable, uh, meaning the path that leads to this Han Shan's place is what? Huh? It's a hermit cave, but metaphorically, it's to their own nature. To Han Shan's place is me, my home. The place to my place is laughable. In other words, at the beginning, someone says, hey, you got the Buddha nature and you can become a Buddha. Why don't you just do it? And you go, ha, ha, ha. That's really funny. It's laughable because from where you are to that, it seems like, come on, get serious. There's no way. So it's laughable. A path, but no sign of cart or horse means? Well, no one's going to take you there. But it's also, no one's laid out the map. This is your own path that you have to walk. If it, was, if it had a sign, a cart, a horse, it wouldn't be yours. It would be somebody else's. Converging gorges, hard to trace their twists. Jumbled cliffs, unbelievably rugged, like Jiang Jia Jia, right? So this idea, when you look at it, it's jumbled cliffs, converging gorges. When, when I sit in meditation here on a Friday night, I'm not on the top of Borobudur. I'm pummeling along in Jiang Jia Jia and not even on the gondola. And there's nobody else there and I don't have a compass. I don't have GPS and it doesn't work there anyhow. And now it's getting dark and it's cold and I'm hungry and where am I going to sleep? And why did I even come here on a Friday night? Blah, 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 right? <laughs> or go to the retreat. A thousand grasses bend with dew. The hill of pines hums in the wind. Now this is both a positive image, but it's also a lonely image. Pines hum in the wind. Any of you been with the pines humming in the wind? In the pines, in the pines, where the sun never shines, and you shudder when the wind blows cold. Okay? This is this feeling. The pines are dark. The pines are... You know, to be in a pine forest, I grew up in, around pine forest, I know this is not a place where you just go to have a good time. You, you want to get to where there's sun and light. The pines can be cold, and when the wind hums, it has a particular sound that's unique. But it's not a kind of well, warm and friendly sound. And now I've lost the shortcut home. <laughs> what does that mean? He thought he was on a quick path. He thought, okay, I'm going to go get enlightened. I, and I, I had a shortcut, and now I can't even find that anymore. Or it could mean I can't find my way out anymore either. <laughs> either way. Body asking shadow. The beautiful image. Body asks, how do you keep up? He's so alone. He's so isolated that all he has is his shadow. And there's this kind of conversation. Will you even stay with me? <laughs> Are we going to be together? Okay, so this is the first one, the difficulty. Look at the second one here. I'm going through these. I'm not giving them full justice, but I'm passing them out. You can see them. Again, he says, rough and dark, the cold mountain trail. Okay, rough and dark, my path back home, my path through my own afflictions. It's rough and it's dark. Remember the passages last week from the Tao Te Ching and so forth. Okay, you, you get the idea, 
right? The, the straightest way seems crooked. The, the way to the light seems dark, and so forth. So he's expressing the same thing. Rough and dark, the cold mountain trail, the trail back to my... Sharp cobbles, the icy creek bank. At every place I turn, there is danger that I could slip, I could fall, I could make a mistake. Yammering, chirping. <laughs> always the birds. What's this one? Yammering, chirping, always the birds. Now, some of you know English, yammering... Yak, yak, yak. When I, when I would get nervous going out in the woods with my grandfather, I'd start talking a lot. Yeah. You know, well, what do you think? What are, we, what are we going to have for dinner tonight? What do you think mom's doing now? Blah, blah, blah. He said, stop yammering. <laughs> <laughs> yammering, chirping, always birds. But it's also what? It's the mind. It's the false thoughts in the mind. It's when you sit in meditation and you say... Tonight, I'm going to enter deep stillness, right? <laughs> right? Or, and then you think, if that person next to me would shut up, stop yammering and chirping, I would get awakened. So you either project it out or you work with it within. Bleak, alone, not even a lone hiker. Wow. All of us, says Tennessee Williams, are sentenced to solitary confinement within our own skins. This bleak alone means when you go on this path back to awakening, you do it yourself. You have your precepts, you have your, your methods and whatnot, but you yourself must walk the path. Buddha's only show the way. And as far as community goes, community is there for a kind of moral support, but community won't make you a Buddha. <laughs> um, when Hung Shir and I were first starting, we had some illusion that you know, we could make each other enlightened or whatever. Um, as soon as the other one stopped yammering and chirping. And uh, our teacher once came in when we were having a, a discussion, and uh, he said, you know, Buddhas don't come in pairs. They come one by one. <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> so, whip, whip, the wind slaps my face. Whirled and tumbled, snow piles on my back. Wow, remember the Kurosawa film we viewed, the, the four vignettes of the snowstorm? There you go again, the, the, the difficulty, I'm sitting in meditation, the wind is whipping at my face, my whole body feels uncomfortable. Whirled and tumble, snow piles on my back, it's hard, everything hurts, it's like I'm carrying this load. Morning after morning, I don't see the sun. Year after year, not a sign of spring. Wow. So you think, give up, man go back home. Now, I could show you the poems where he says, why would I go back home? All they do is make money there. What joy in that. <laughs> so he says, but you see, these first two are describing his entry into that and the difficulty that the other Han Shan describes. Now, I'm shooting ahead a little bit where you see he stays with it. He persists. He doesn't retreat. And now it starts to change. And the mountain, which used to be cold and foreboding and whatnot, his mind, his nature, is starting to now turn into the opposite. So let's look at this one. Spring water in the green creek is clear, not murky anymore. Moonlight on cold mountain is white, pure, penetrating. Silent knowledge, the spirit is enlightened of itself. Contemplate the void, this world exceeds stillness. Total different imagery here of someone who's now come at peace with himself, with the mountain, and is actually what was cold and hostile before now is refreshing and liberating. On top of cold mountain, the lone round moon lights the whole clear cloudless sky. Think again of the top of Borbadur. This image, what is the moon, by the way? People familiar with the, the moon in, in this Chan poetry? Yeah, what? Sarah, you've been working on this stuff, haven't you? A little. <laughs> and the moon? Awakening. The moon is full. It's, it's full awakening. And the moon, and then shines, or radiates a light unless you see, even in the nighttime. But the moon also represents this orb of bright light moving through the sky and completely unattached. There's no string holding it up. So this is the enlightened being, the enlightened mind. As the moon moves through the sky, so does the unattached, unbound, liberated mind move through the world. Um, so on top, the lone lights the whole clear, cloudless sky. Cloudless sky? 
Now before, wow, let's see, world and tumble snow, morning, morning, I don't see the sun, and now you have a cloud of sky. What happened? Huh? Yeah, the clouds are what? Imagery again. Huh? Illusory, but also fun now. So when the sixth patriarch says the, the nature is like the moon and the sun, they shine bright above, but the clouds come in and obscure our view. You remove the clouds and once again it's there. So the clouds are the dust, the temporary attachments and confusion we have. It's, it's the klesha. But now the sky is cloudless. He's seen through it. He's put it down. Then he says, honor this priceless natural, natural treasure. Wow. Concealed in five shadows, sunk deep in the flesh. Now, what's he talking about? Honor this priceless natural treasure, this jewel that's concealed in the five shadows. What are the five shadows? The five skandhas. And in fact, sometimes it's translated as the five heaps or the five shadows. This makes up the illusory sense of self, body and mind that we take to be real, but it's just a passing phenomenon. So he says, concealed right within this thing, this body and mind, is this priceless jewel. So this goes back to say, so therefore, an awakening and enlightenment doesn't come by renouncing this or dying to this, but through the cultivation and refinement of this. So right within that body, he's found the jewel. Deep in the flesh. That's a nice imagery. Okay, let's go. We'll go to the last poem here tonight. I might, we might do a whole class on Han Chan's poetry. This is, of course, I don't have the Chinese, so Iwan, would you mind finding the Chinese for this and putting up? Okay. We got some real uh, aesthetics in here, <laughs> myself included. I love the poetry. My home was at Cold Mountain from the start. Huh? What is that saying? You, yes. In other words, I'm going to this mountain. He gets there and he says, my home was at Cold Mountain in the start. In other words, it's a complete return. Very much like uh, the youth gone to um, um, good wealth, Sudana, who does the spiritual journey. He starts with Manjushri Bodhisattva, then goes after 53 different advisors and ends up back with Manjushri Bodhisattva. In other words, the spiritual journey was a complete circle. Now, I don't want to get into Dorothy and, you know, in Kansas, but, you know, <laughs> there's a similar thing going on here. Home is where I started and where I returned to. And so in the spiritual cultivation, you realize it's only a distant cold mountain because you've allowed your distance and your mind to separate from it. When you get back to it and reunite with it, you realize it's been my home all along. Cold mountain was in my being from the very start. Rambling among the hills far from trouble. Rambling in the hills far from trouble means free and easy, zidzai. Okay, it's what the Sixth Patriarch describes as an unattached, unbound, liberated state where you move freely through the world, responding and dealing with things, but getting stuck nowhere. Gone, and a million things leave no trace, loosed, loosened up, and it flows through galaxies. This is the freely functioning, enlightened mind. Going and returning with no border, movement and stillness have one source. Embracing multitude of wonders, yet more remains. Overstepping words and thoughts by far, this is, this is what's being talked about here. A fountain of light into the very mind. Not a thing, and yet it appears before me. This is wonderful. Now I know the pearl of the Buddha nature. Know its use. A boundless, perfect sphere. Referring back again to the image of the moon. So you see, I mean, we could go into this much more, we don't have time, but look at the contrast between the first two where he's beginning and struggling, and then the last two where he's trying to use language, metaphorical language, to describe this feeling. But it communicates, yes? In some ways, it communicates more than abstract philosophical terms. And I suspect it's because we actually do think and feel through imagery much more than we do through abstractions, and that's why this is really very rich, concrete. And in fact, if you notice, when you dream, you dream like this. You don't dream sentence by sentence. You dream in this imagery. So there's something about this imagery that's very evocative and I think very reflective of the human consciousness. So I just wanted to share 
uh, Hanchan's poems tonight as, a, as another example. So we have imagery and then we have the poetic language that conveys the richness of this kind of spiritual journey. Good? Yeah. Um, so those of you who are interested, if Iwan finds the Chinese for it, and my guess is she'll do it tonight before she goes to sleep, because <laughs> she likes it so much, then we can have this translation up there, and those of you who are interested in the Chinese can look at the original Chinese. Uh, you just, how do you get to that site, by the way? How would they find that if they wanted to see? Okay, so there's a disembodied voice behind that. <laughs> It's actually a person, Yen Lin and Locke. So if you give them your email address, you want to have this text uh, shared, then you can do that. Okay. 20 we watched it. Uh, one night when you weren't here, we showed it. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a good movie because it takes you both through the poetry and into the actual landscape. Um, but I should say, at the same time, this you can do in your back porch. You can do in your living room. If your mind is right, you can do this whole journey working through all of this right in the space you're in right now. You do not have to go. And so many things, whew, thank goodness, because I don't like the cold and the snow. And I, you do not have to go there to do this. It's metaphor, it's symbol. This is about the inner journey. So you can do this any place. You can be in Cold Mountain in the midst of a busy marketplace. <laughs> and on the real Cold Mountain, you can be just as if you were in a busy marketplace at the mall. Each way wations out. It's all made from consciousness or mind alone. Okay, we'll close there for tonight. Um, any announcements? If you've never seen and heard Gwyneth play, and especially it'll be a close venue, it'll be a little more intimate because it's in a church, um, I would do it. It's well worth doing. I mean, we listen to CDs all the time, but when you actually get into the surround sound of that and then see her body and focus and concentration working with the music, it's, it's quite inspiring. It's a kind of kung fu. It's a kind of samadhi. So if you haven't seen that before, uh, this would be a good opportunity to go. Um, anything else? Yeah, we have a one in session coming up this starting Saturday night. Um, that's the Purifying Boundaries, and that basically starts the session. And Sunday is the celebration day for, I believe, Guan and Bodhisattva leaving home. So on Sunday, there will be a, a whole day of events up at the City of Pindaman Buddhas about two hours north of here. And that begins, and that evening will be the orientation for those who might be here the first time at a session, or even others as well. And it'll be in English, and we're gonna have to start the week session. So people who are interested in going, um, who are completely new, if you go on the, week, the, the evening of the Sunday, the Sunday, and stay for a week, it's a really good event to participate in. So if you're interested, <coughs> Oh, you want me to do the mic? Okay. I don't even want to do that. That's good. Thanks. Okay. So we have a we have us on Sunday night of this one in session. We have a um, orientation for those who might wish to have English discussions around Guanyin Bodhisattva's practices. So it's a really good chance to practice intensively and also learn Dharma. So there's a there's going to be a group of of English you know, classes similar to what Marty does here in the evenings, but around the po practice of Guanyin Bodhisattva. And then anything else? 
we have going on tomorrow. We have the regular events here on Saturday. We have the Dharma Assembly in the morning, uh, the noon meal for people to join. And then we have meditation and evening ceremony as usual. We have the Avatamsaka Sutra Lecture. Dharma Master Fan from the city will be coming down. Siddhananda the Buddhas. So that's a very good lecture. How, work for? Oh, the Walk for Hunger. I don't actually quite know the details of that. Do you know when that will be? Going from one place to another, or yeah, they are going to travel around the monastery around the San Francisco city. And they're going to stop at different monasteries. Stop, right? And that's what you said. Right, and now with the parks right on, so oh. you might walk over there too. <laughs> 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 okay, we're going to do a transference in English. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.